Very good. So uh, we'll uh, go over pulmonary hypertension and RV failure. Um, you know, some of you may be wondering why you know we're talking about pulmonary hypertension in a cardiology talk, and uh, um, uh, how many of your uh, programs have uh, cardiologists taking care of pulmonary hypertension? Yeah, it's about. <laughs> That's kind of an average about 40% of the programs. <laughs> so, and, so um, you know, um, one of the reasons I think all cardiologists should know about pulmonary hypertension is because at least uh, as of 2013, when the definitions changed, you really almost need a cardiologist now to make a diagnosis of pulmonary arterial hypertension because uh, pulmonary hypertension is defined as mean pulmonary artery pressure over uh, 25 millimeters of mercury at rest. Uh, but pulmonary arterial hypertension really requires a right heart cath now, and really almost universally, you know, it's really the cardiologists who do right heart catheterizations in the cath lab. So the pulmonary arterial hypertension is defined as, you know, mean pulmonary artery pressure over 25 millimeters of mercury with a wedge pressure of less than 15 end expiratory and a PVR. So PVR is defined as, you know, mean pulmonary artery pressure minus the wedge pressure or uh, cardiac output. Um, that should be greater than three wood units, uh, or 240 dynes per centimeter uh, square, which is essentially you, you uh, multiply uh, three by 80. So um, when you look at pulmonary arterial hypertension, um, so there are five, pulmonary hypertension, there are five subgroups. The first one is pulmonary arterial hypertension, which uh, is mainly idiopathic, uh, you know, uh, associated with connective tissue disorders, HIV, portal hypertension, congenital heart disease, which is almost contributes to about 10% uh, uh, of acquired pulmonary arterial hypertension. And the most common cause for pulmonary hypertension is due to left heart disease. And that's why I think, you know, uh, cardiologists need to be aware of pulmonary hypertension. And uh, it's caused by venous hypertension, and uh, um, whether it's due to uh, LV systolic or diastolic uh, dysfunction, or valvular disease, um, all of this, uh, you know, uh, due to elevated wedge pressure end up causing pulmonary hypertension. The third group is due to uh, lung disease. Fourth group is due to chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. And group five is due to uh, unclear multifactorial mechanisms, mainly hematologic disorders. And uh, so this is, again, uh, going through, you know, why patients have uh, pulmonary hypertension. And as you can see here, you know, it's almost 75 to 80 percent of patients have it due to left heart disease. Um, and when we get to pulmonary arterial hypertension, again, the uh, definition here being that the wedge pressure is less than 15 which is what differentiates this from, you know, pulmonary hypertension due to left heart disease where your wedge pressure is going to be greater than 15. Uh, again, the symptoms and signs suggestive of pulmonary hypertension, which are, you know, shortness of breath, fatigue, syncope, presyncope, and a lot of right-sided symptoms, abdominal fullness, abdominal bloating, you know, uh, peripheral edema. Um, and then if uh, you get an echo echocardiography is your main screening tool because that's how you're going to get an estimated, you know, PA systolic pressure and look at the right side of the heart. If you have right-sided dysfunction, right atrial enlargement, then it should uh, raise your suspicion for pulmonary hypertension. And then you get a series of tests to really sort of uh, look at other causes of, uh, you know, having shortness of breath or having pulmonary hypertension, like, you know, looking at intrinsic lung disease, looking if patients have a chronic thromboembolic pH. There, the test to do is a VQ scan. Your CT scan of P protocol is not as sensitive as picking up chronic thromboembolic pH as is uh, a, a VQ scan. And then, if, and then finally getting a right heart cath, which you see at the bottom of the screen, and uh, you know, defining the hemodynamics, looking at the mean PA pressures, looking at the wedge pressure, looking at the cardiac output, and then uh, seeing if they fit into either uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension or just pulmonary hypertension due to either, you know, uh, pulmonary venous hypertension. So again, once you diagnose that somebody has pulmonary arterial hypertension, your next step is to look at 
what uh, uh, could be contributing to it, whether it's connective tissue disorders, whether you have cirrhosis, you have, you know, mo most often for cardiologists, you know, um, there is a lot of missed ASD or missed, uh, you know, uh, partial anomalous pulmonary venous return that you get patients who are 30s, 40s, they come in with shortness of breath, you see that the right side is a little bit enlarged, and you do diagnose pulmonary hypertension, a lot of them end up have, you know, that diagnosing ASD for the first time in their lives, especially if you're practicing in the south of the country because you have a lot of immigrants who have not had access to care in their first few years of life. Um, and then, so what are we looking for in terms of, uh, you know, therapy for these patients, really three prominent, um, uh, you know, approved pathways uh, for therapy. The, uh, the first one is the prostacycline pathway for which we have the most evidence in terms of it uh, providing uh, survival benefit. And, uh, um, you know, initially we started off using just IV therapy, which is IV Flolan, IV Velletri, IV Remodel, and these are all prostacyclines. And then, uh, you know, and then progress to inhaled therapies, and now we have an approved oral prostacycline uh, which can be used. Um, and the second pathway is the endothelin pathway, and you know, the th three drugs approved there are uh, bosentan, macetentan, and ambrosentan, which again uh, help um, block the endothelin receptors, uh, you know, A and B, depending on the drug, uh, and uh, help decrease vasoconstriction and proliferation. And the third pathway is the nitric oxide pathway, and the most common drug that you all use, you know, in, in this pathway is sildenafil or tadalafil, which is a phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitor. And uh, the re recently approved therapy, which you will be hearing more, more is a soluble, soluble guanylate cyclase stimulator, or SGC stimulator, which is riosequad. And you will be hearing of more trials in uh, using uh, medications in this pathway in heart failure as well in, in, in the coming uh, months to years. So uh, if you suspect pulmonary arterial hypertension, so what do you do in the lab? You do vasoreactivity testing, either using nitric oxide if it's available in your institution, or using prostacyclines or uh, adenosine, and establish vasoreactivity. Because if the patient is vasoreactive, then there is a likelihood that they may just respond to calcium channel blockers. Now, if they are not vasoreactive, then uh, if you do not have a pH, uh, you know, approved center, I mean, a pH center in your um, institution, then you should refer uh, the patient to one of the pH centers so that uh, uh, we can assess patients for, um, you know, which class, which functional class they fall into and then treat them appropriately. Again, if they have inadequate clinical response to medications, then you're really looking at lung transplantation. Uh, in terms of determinants of risk, if you have RV failure, whether clinically or echocardiographically, then they are at higher risk. Again, like in heart failure, if you have a uh, worse functional class, you are at higher risk of not doing well. Uh, this is a risk score which was recently developed to uh, assess patients uh, with pulmonary hypertension. Now, switching gears and going into RV failure, um, um, you know, um, how do you define RV failure? This is an intermax definition which was really uh, developed in uh, the context of left-sided mechanical circulatory support. Uh, again, but this is sort of something that we can use for, uh, you know, all causes of uh, right-sided heart failure when you have CVP greater than 18 and cardiac index less than two. But in the absence of, you know, left-sided heart failure or tamponade or ventricular arrhythmia, um, and um, these, you can grade them into severe, moderate, or mild, severe uh, requiring RVAD implantation, moderate requiring, you know, inotropes or inhaled pulmonary vasodilatory use, and mild are those with whom you can just uh, manage with diuretic. Uh, again, what are the causes of acute RV failure? You're looking at, you know, post-cardiotomy shock, post-cabbage, post-LVAD, post-mitral valve surgery, acute pulmonary embolism, acute RV infarction, or decompensated pulmonary hypertension. Um, and uh, I'm going to skip on the slide. Now, how do you manage these patients? 
Uh, again, it's mostly etiology-specific management. If you're looking at somebody who has an RVMI or pulmonary uh, embolus, you look at how you can uh, take care of that, whether it's PCI or uh, thrombolytics. And you're looking at PE, thrombolytics, Dr. Uh, Park will talk more about this uh, in, in the afternoon. So it, you're looking at, again, either catheter-directed thrombolytics or systemic thrombolytics. And uh, um, preload optimization, uh, afterload optimization, and then inotropy, like all other heart failure, uh, uh, like left-sided heart failure management. So preload optimization, you know, uh, so just going on Frank Starling curve, you need it to be optimized. You know, I think it is reasonable to give them maybe 250 cc or 500 cc of saline, but if they do not improve with that, there is no point in giving them more because you're going to just tip them off. Um, and then you're looking at, uh, you know, adding inotropes and afterload optimization using uh, uh, specific pulmonary vasodilators. Again, it's very, very important to have protective ventilation because PEEP can really add to the right ventricular stress, so you have to minimize PEEP and really avoid you know, hypercarbia and hypoxia because there are two potent pulmonary vasoconstrictors which you really want to avoid. Um, again, like we said, correctable causes. Um, and when you're looking at sort of more non-specific uh, afterload reduction, you're looking at inhaled nitric oxide, which has been shown in studies uh, post-operative RV failure after cabbage, valve, and LVAD to be beneficial. But if you have RV failure uh, due to car pulmonale from, you know, chronic COPD or, uh, or respiratory failure, nitric oxide has really not been shown to be beneficial because it really does not address the underlying cause of uh, RV failure in these patients. Um, again, use of inotropes. Uh, the two most common inotropes that we use here are dobutamine and milrinone. Uh, the choice really depends on whether you're dealing with a high PVR or not. If you're dealing with a high PVR, milrinone is probably preferable. If you're dealing with an intrinsic RV issue, we prefer dobutamine. But avoiding vasopressors, very, very important, especially avoiding norepinephrine and do dopamine in these patients because they also have a pulmonary vasoconstrictive effect. If you want to use a vasopressor, use vasopressin in these patients. Um, and if all fails and you can't, uh, you know, you really need to go to mechanical circulatory support, you can use short-term or long-term support. But since we are dealing with uh, acute RV failure, looking at short-term support, the main question to ask is, is the patient hypoxic? Are the lungs involved? Because if the lungs are involved, you are really looking at you know, uh, ECMO. Uh, if you don't have uh, pulmonary hypertension, then uh, the options you can use are you know, things like Impella RP and the right-sided tandem. Uh, Dr. Brown spoke to you a little bit about this. Uh, you know, it's again, uh, um, going through your femoral vein and getting past the um, um, tricuspid valve and then going up the pulmonary artery and, um, um, uh, you know, you're essentially bypassing. This is the inflow here uh, uh, in the IVC and the outflow in the pulmonary artery. Uh, and this is the right-sided tandem. Uh, and uh, ECMO, again, we've gone through this where um, the inflow, I mean, uh, the inflow into the pump is from the right atrium and then the uh, outflow is into the aorta. And it's essentially like a small cardiopulmonary bypass machine which where you provide oxygenated blood flow. And this probably would be the, your go-to uh, option in, in somebody who has pulmonary hypertension and has a failing right ventricle. And you're bridging them to a possible lung transplant. Right. Again, uh, in conclusion, uh, you know, pH could be, should be considered often in your diagnosis of uh, unexplained dyspnea, and right heart cath really is needed to tease out why somebody has pulmonary hypertension, and risk stratification is really important, and a sort of early referral to pH treatment centers uh, uh, is really important in, in taking care of these patients. Yeah. So, thank you. Thank you, Ash.